Good day, this is Jim Pytel from Columbia Gorge Community College Renewable Energy Technology Program. This is EAT 123 Digital 3. Today we are going to discuss digital signal processing, better known by its acronym DSP. Purpose of DSP, it converts naturally occurring analog signals into a digital form so that these signals can be enhanced and modified for various applications. Just so happens that this lecture is being recorded on the birthday of a very special person, and that very special person is Pac-Man. He's celebrating his 30th birthday today. And just take two seconds and take your notebook out and just draw Pac-Man for me. Okay, so I'm going to wait for you. So you just drew Pac-Man, and I would say 99.9% .9 of you guys Drew Pac-Man like that. Sometimes he has an eye. And that's not Pac-Man. So, take a second for that to sink in. Yeah, that is your idealized version of Pac-Man. Pac-Man really looks like this, though. Which is a pixelated version of Pac-Man. And the point is, it's close enough to a smooth analog si signal that your brain just kind of perceives Pac-Man as this nice circular figure. And if your computer was even more powerful, those pixels would be much, much smaller. And it would look like that. Oh, this is a really squished Pac-Man. It would look more like this. OK? So. Believe it or not, I just tied Pac-Man into digital signal processing. But um, let's go ahead and look at our block diagram of DSP. So our block diagram of DSP is we've got an analog signal right here coming into this filter. And basically, the filter's whole purpose in life is to remove unwanted signals. Let's say if there is a, uh, um, a high-frequency noise that is occurring that you know that is going to be occurring, why not filter that thing out with a low pass filter? Okay. Then we've got this thing called a sample and hold. And we're going to come back to the sample and hold. And that's basically using the Nyquist sampling theorem. We're going to come back to that. And we've got this thing called an ADC, analog to digital converter. And finally, we've got the, it goes into the DSP, where it can be enhanced and modified for the various applications. And then we've got this thing, the exact opposite, is the digital to analog converter. And then we've got our reconstruction filter, because what comes out of the DAC is something equivalent to our Pac-Man there, kind of pixelated edges. And our reconstruction filter can smooth that out for us. OK, so now this may seem to some folks as paint the house unpaint the house. It doesn't really make sense. Why would you go ahead and paint the house and then go ahead and the same day unpaint the house. Well, you're not really doing that. What you're actually doing, this thing right here is again, is it's enhancing and modifying our signal. You know, it might be a very small analog signal. And the DSP is in fact amplifying it. And you've got this large output signal right there. So it's enhancing and modifying it. And then the other reason is let's go back to our basic reasons here. Why we use digital in the first place. You know, the digital advantage, it's processed and transmitted more efficiently and reliably. It can be reproduced with greater accuracy and clarity. It can be stored more compactly. And it's also not as affected by unwanted voltage fluctuations, i.e. noise. So the very simple advantage of putting something in a digital form, you're gaining all those advantages that we've got there. OK? So um, this sample and hold thing is, and by the way, we're going to go there we're going to have a whole lecture on analog to digital conversion and digital to analog conversion, because that's the whole point of DSP. Um, so we're just going to
basically just use these this block diagram as our basics now. We're going to go into each one of those in depth and the different ways to do all those things. But the thing we're going to talk about in this lecture is the sample and hold. Okay, and you guys saw my little sneak preview here, the Nyquist sampling theorem. So Nyquist sampling theorem can, believe it or not, be actually introduced with these two famous characters here. First one is Lassie, and the next one is Bruce Lee. Okay, so Lassie. What is the Lassie example illustrating the Nyquist sampling theorem? I know that I've got introduced Pac-Man, Lassie, and Bruce Lee in one lecture. So how does it work here? Okay, so Farmer Brown driving down the driveway in his truck as he goes to work, and he sees Lassie passed out asleep in the sun next to the mailbox. And he leaves and goes to work. And now, Timmy falls in the well. Lassie gets up, runs and saves Timmy. Then there's a forest fire and saves Timmy from the forest fire. Ben saves Timmy from a bear. And then Timmy is messing around in the medicine cabinet and ingests a bunch of, uh, I don't know, some codeine. And Lassie rushes him to the ER. And then finally, Timmy falls asleep, and Lassie's like, geez, I can rest, and goes back and falls asleep by the mailbox. And Farmer Brown comes home, and he sees Lassie in the same spot where he left her, and he's like, lazy dog. So keep that in mind as we progress to our next example. Next example is Bruce Lee. So Bruce Lee in the filming of Enter the Dragon. Seriously, the guy that was running the camera was like, Bruce Lee, stop doing what you're doing. You're going way too fast for us to capture you doing the moves that you're doing. So basically, here he is getting ready to kill somebody. And the camera takes a picture. You know, because the camera's moving in frames. Bruce Lee goes ahead and kills somebody and moves back to the exact same position he was in, and the camera takes another picture. Except this time, even though he's in the same position, there's a dead guy laying next to him. So what's happening there is Bruce Lee is moving way too fast for the camera to catch him. And in the same occurrence with the whole Lassie phenomenon here, Farmer Brown only looked at Lassie two times during the day, and it just so happened to be Lassie was in the same spot, even though some other action has occurred in between the time that you sampled them. Okay, that was the whole point of this lecture. Believe it or not, I did tie Lassie and Bruce Lee and Pac-Man into this. Basically, Farmer Brown and the camera crew were sampling Lassie and Bruce Lee at far too slow a frequency. Okay, so now let's bring ourselves to our case of a sine wave. Here's our sine wave. It has a certain frequency to it. And if I were to sample it right here, and remember our, our wave is repetitive, and again right here at the same frequency, And again, right there, but I didn't look at any of the spots in between, what would I assume that that wave would be? Well, I'm assuming that that wave is a steady DC signal that happens to have that magnitude right there. So we've introduced a problem here by we are not sampling at the correct Nyquist sampling frequency. What the Nyquist sampling frequency states is that you have to sample something at twice the frequency of its naturally occurring frequency. Okay, so here is the period of this particular wave. So we have to sample this wave to get an accurate, rep at least, and again, the Nyquist sampling theorem is the minimum frequency. This is the absolute minimum frequency you can get. If you go at a faster rate, if you sample things at a faster rate, you're just going to get that better of a rendition of it. So let's say the Nyquist sampling frequency is occurring at half the period. So we're sampling it here 
and here, and here, and here. So we get this time varying waveform that even though it is not a sine wave, it's a lot closer approximation than our earlier version, which was a straight DC value. Okay, so now let's say we go ahead and sample again at twice that frequency, you're going to get an even better rendition of it. Twice that frequency, it's going to get more confusing. You're going to get an even better rendition of a sine wave. Okay, so the other thing is too, even if you sample it at the minimum, Nyquist sampling frequency, you're often sampling a sine wave anyway, so you just assume rather than drawing that sawtooth wave that we did originally there, you would just say, okay, it really is a sine wave in between there, in between here, those two sample points. Okay, so Nyquist sampling theorem is again, you need to sample something at least twice the frequency that it is occurring. So one would say that our cameraman here, he's at least got to get one more frame. And then let's say he was going at 15 frames per second. He needs to actually run that camera at least 30 frames per second to catch Bruce Lee decapitating this dude. The other thing with Farmer Brown here, Farmer Brown has got at least got to come home from lunch to see the fact that Lassie's, in fact, talking Timmy down off of a ledge. And then he can go back to work and come back home to see Lassie passed out asleep here. Okay, so Nyquist sampling theorem, got to sample it at least twice the frequency of its naturally occurring. Um, believe it or not, I did do it. Lassie and Bruce Lee, Nyquist sampling theorem. All right, so what are we going to talk about now? We're going to talk about our sample and hold. Okay, so sample and hold. Here we go, we've got a little AC signal, little sine wave, and we want to sample this guy. And let's say we sample it right here at that moment, and we happen to sample it right here. Have we achieved the minimum Nyquist sampling frequency? And the answer is no, because we are sampling at the same frequency and again, the classic example, Lassie's passed out when Farmer Brown leaves for work. Lassie's passed out in the same spot when Farmer Brown comes home from work. So that's not going to work. So we need to at least sample it at twice the frequency right there. And if you want even at more accurate representation, start sampling it at higher and higher frequencies. And this is again, this is a this is why we've got Pac-Man in the picture. The more pixels there are, the more Pac-Man looks like his round shape. Okay? So now what is the hold? We've just discussed sample. And now the hold is basically all you're going to do is just take that sample, and in between samples, you're going to keep it at that same level. Okay, this is kind of uh, like you measuring something. You measure something 12 inches, and you go ahead and you go to your notebook and you write down my, uh, let's see, this, this plant that's growing super fast is 12 inches. And then a day later, you come back and you measure, and it's 13 inches. You know, basically, you've held the length of that that plant at 12 inches. This is a really dumb example, um, but basically, it's a hold. It's just saying it's at this level right here until we sample the next time. I don't care what those intermediate values are in between. So let's zoom in on this thing right here. The zoom in thing, which I'm going to draw over here. I know the sine wave is doing this graceful curve here, and I know that I've sampled it there. And it happens to be, let's say, 8 volts at 
this exact point. And the next time I sample it, it's going to be then. What I'm going to do is just assume that it's 8 volts until the next time I sample it. And it just so happens to be, let's say, 6 volts. I know that there is some error here that's occurring here. But if my sampling frequency is fast enough, that's kind of negligible. Refer to our Pac-Man example right here. I know that our little blocky Pac-Man is kind of blocky, but he really does look like that. So I don't care. Just draw Pac-Man like this. I don't care. All I want to do is eat some ghosts. Okay, so our sample, taking it, and in between samples, we hold it and allow the DSP to do whatever it's doing to enhance and modify that signal, whether it's amplifying it, reducing it, uh, putting in some funky distortion, uh, encoding it, you know, say if you're, you're a secret agent and you want to encode it so you can send it back to the mother country, it's doing all those cool things to it while it's holding it. Okay, so now we're going to go back into, we just did the kind of the brief walkover of the whole schmagaggy here. And now we're going to go in and talk about each one of these guys in turn. The ADC, the DAC, analog to digital converter and digital to analog converter. And by the way, there's a bunch of different types of each one of those things, some of which have are more common and have a little bit um, different features. Okay, so let's move on to... ADC.